uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the opportunity. Thanks for coming before us. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to uh, go into based on um, my understanding of your operation. I'd like some verification on um, how, are you, how you're managing uh, internal operations. Uh, Mr. Holstrom started uh, the conversation with talking about being responsible for uh, preparation and emergency response. What um, emergency response did uh, Eversource take uh, in the five days coming up uh, before the, uh, the storm hit on Tuesday? Mr. Holstrom talked about they watched the storm come up. I'm wondering what specific actions were taken in terms of preparation uh, for the storm's arrival. Sure, so I, so I can speak to that. So we have a, a you know, a very well documented plan and we have a very well documented management structure that we use, you know, we really use it every day. Um, you know, watching the weather is, is what we do. Um, in the case of this event, you know, again, we have various weather forecasts and weather services. We you know, tap into, you know, National Hurricane Sur Service, uh, the Weather Service, and, and and we keep an eye on things. But the week before the storm, it looked as if, you know, we had the potential of getting impacted. So myself as the, as the uh, responsible executive um, called uh, a group together called our emer emergency coordination team that has all the major executives for every branch of our emergency plan, like logistics, communications, um, electric operations, um, safety. And we brought that team together to talk about the potential event. We have our weather service gets on. We talk, uh, we listen to the, to the latest forecast. And then we have incident, we follow the incident command structure, just like many organizations uh, when we deal with these storms. So I have an incident commander in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. I called those folks together and we started talking about resources and planning, especially because we were in the pandemic. Um, you know, as soon as, as soon as we started operating within the pandemic protocols, emergency preparedness was one of those things that we said, hey, we really gotta, we really gotta think about how this would change things. You know, normally everybody would come into our service centers or our offices and facilities and do their roles, but with so many people working remotely, that certainly would change the plan. So we, many months ago, actually uh, reviewed our plan, made uh, adjustments, had meetings, had training, um, so people could understand how we would operate. The people who have roles in our plans, how their role would change, their emergency response role would change, and what they would do uh, in the event we had a major, a major uh, restoration effort. Um, but that week before, you know, we watching the weather many times every day, um, continually look at, you know, what's the impact going to be for our service territory. We have a resource acquisition group that we spin up and their primary role is to look at all of our resources available. So as we just spoke about, we have a number of internal line workers that are uh, with us every day. But we also have a very, very large contingent of contractors uh, who work for us every day. Local 42 Connecticut uh, provides several hundred contractors to us every single day, and they work uh, almost seamlessly um, in terms of um, an internal worker and an external contractor on our property. So we take account of those people. Uh, we look at other contractors, partnerships that we had that maybe unaffiliated with EEI because that's important. Uh, affiliated contractors, uh, to, to get those resources, you need to go through mutual aid. But there's other companies out there that are doing work and not necessarily um, affiliated, so we can tap into those, and that's what we did. Um, uh, as you know, we went up into, up into Canada to bring resources down. Um, you know, the other big thing that happens prior to the storm hitting is the whole logistics piece, right? You bring in, you know, what what ultimately, you know, was 2,500 crews, you know, 9,000, you know, individuals and another 2,800 Eversource in, individuals. So now you need to feed them, you need to house them, you need to make sure they have materials, 
Uh, you have to onboard them. So all those activities happen well before the storm. We start setting up staging areas. We move stock. Um, we start talking to hotels. And clearly, during the pandemic, you know, that's a real, a real challenge because we would – you know, traditionally move crews and people around closer and closer to the to the hottest impacted areas. But in the, in the case of the pandemic, we really needed to keep people contained. Um, and in many cases, single rooms as opposed to double rooms. So so that demand for lodging um, was a challenge. We brought in companies like Base Logistics, who is their business to set up temporary shelter, temporary temporary kitchens, restrooms, washrooms. So all those activities have to take place well before um, the impact of the storm. Um, so when the storm actually hits, all those logistical things, staging areas, lodging, stock, uh, we make calls to all our municipals to make contact. We um, call customers who have different types of health issues to give them warning and notice. Um, you know, all those activities get done days and weeks before the actual the actual event. So those are those are just some of the things that that we do to get ready for these events. And and we're doing it again, as I said, you know, we're doing this a week out. The storm is still down, you know, pretty far down south, but um, in an event like this, we know you have to be ready. You know, we have to have boots on the ground. We have to have all these systems set up. You know, it's not something you can do after the fact. That would just drag out restoration to uh, to even longer. So all these things have to be ready to go. And when the first customer goes out, all systems are up and running. Thank you very much. I, I mentioned that because I have uh, been in contact with some people that are involved with the State of Florida's Emergency Operations Center and Florida Light and Power, uh, their procedures as to how they go forward and imagine that they handle a few more hurricanes and, and events than uh, than we do. Um, I've, act I've actually visited uh, I've actually vis visited the storm center at Florida Light and Power, and that's that's another thing we do is you know as an industry we benchmark and look at best practices and and clearly they have an awful lot of experience. They offer two or three simulations a year um, uh, on catastrophic events. I, you know, I'm familiar with how that goes. Being a former first selectman in uh, in the vicinity of a nuclear plant, and uh, you know, the state and local communities hold um, uh, simulations of crisis uh, occurrences, uh, yep. which is a good model, I think, uh, to go forward because you know the, the nuclear folks do that very well. Um, and so I was curious if you provide the same type of simulation. They they do fuel checks and uh, make ready for employees, make sure their staff is going to be available to be on site, equipment checks, uh, all of those things, so that uh, that's one part of the equation that's taken off the table when the bell rings. Yeah. So as I said, we we practice and work on our emergency response all year round. You know, this is an activity that we understand is a, is a huge obligation. So again, I, I chair a group called the, the executive coordination team. We meet monthly, regardless if there's an event or not. And we talk about our plans, are we staffed, have people left positions, um, you know, do we need to do enhanced training? And then the next level down is the incident command level. And as I said, I have incident commanders in both, in all three states. Those, those groups meet several times a month with all their incident command teams. And we we look at small events, we look at big events and continuously ask ourselves, did it go well? How could it improve? And and we can continually, continually tune and work on that. You know, we do things like, uh, we do drills. We, uh, especially during this pandemic, we've been communicating to employees regularly because we want wanted employees to understand that even though, you know, we are working remotely in a lot of cases, you know, that the expectation and the need is for employees to respond, you know, when, when they need it. And, and, and you know, I'm very happy to say during this event, people people stepped up and, and, and did their jobs remarkably. Um, 
We have online training that's mandated every year for all our employees. We uh, we do drills. We do drills with communities. We have community meetings several times a year. So, you know, this this whole idea around emergency preparedness is a task that um, that I take very very seriously, and we're constantly improving, preparing, and prepping. <clears throat> I just just like to add a, a comment or two to to Craig's uh, explanation, which was very good. But to give you some sense for the communications, the executive coordinating team that that he heads uh, every every day during this tropical storm event, we had a discussion of probably the top sixty executives from every discipline in the company at nine o'clock and at five p.m. And when the pandemic hit, we had a call every single day dealing with the pandemic. We had a call yesterday, uh, an ECT call uh, in terms of a pandemic update. And we've been very, very fortunate. 8,300 employees, we've had 54 that have been impacted. And I think it's because of the oversight and the direction that this group has provided. The last COVID case that of an employee in, in Connecticut has a July date on it. So I know Connecticut has done extremely well overall. But we're pleased with the effort that within Eversource we've been able to maintain as well. And, and it really became challenging when you have crews coming in from outside. So the onboarding process was important. We created contact tracing for, 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 for these folks that were coming in. And uh, fortunately, from the update we got yesterday, we don't have any indication of COVID-related illnesses associated with the, uh, the event. Thank you. It's definitely a, a different time uh, when those uh, those safety mechanisms have to be put in place with regard to this. My question with regard to the simulations and all of those other things, uh, perhaps a, a, a suggestion that um, municipalities typically are not involved in your preparations, uh, yet municipalities are involved in all of the nuclear presentation and stimulations that occur. And, uh, you know, I may make a suggestion that you broaden your, your uh, your simulations, your training, your get make ready situations uh, to include municipalities, uh, because I think that might be one way to improve uh, the communications with municipalities. And as a, as I said, a former first selectman during the hurricanes, we did have a liaison. The liaison was very good, but oftentimes uh, it was difficult for them to get information from the company, uh, and they were just uh, as much in the dark as we were. Uh, in spite of your, you know, nine in the morning, five in the afternoon um, uh, contacts with management, that, uh, there's got to be more uh, continual contacts. And perhaps by involving uh, municipal leaders and uh, so that they can mobilize their public works team to assist uh, in, uh, in debris clearing and, and whatever else they can do to make roads ready uh, might be something moving forward. Uh, moving so I, I, and, uh, I just mean... I may not have been clear, but we, we work with the municipals all through the year. We have meetings with the municipals on Eversource property. Liaisons work with municipals um, and, and directly with their EOCs. You know, we, we certainly can always do more. And, you know, that's a very, very important relationship during a, an event. Um, but we, we do work with municipals. And we also, you know, we, we hit, we're involved with national level drills as well. So, um, but... Right. Let's I move on. There's a lot of people that want to get on, uh, get some questions in. Uh, moving on, did uh, you talked about out of work crews, uh, out of state crews, and did did Eversource? Did you send any uh, technicians or staff or or uh, line crews to other states before, during, or after uh, this this latest storm? We did not. We did not. Um, Thank you. And. Uh, do you have contracts in place for third party um, uh, response crews um, that that you just keep in track or how does that work? We do. We have, we have as I said, we have hundreds of, of local 42 contractors who work in Connecticut every single day. Um, you know, many of those are on multi-year contracts. Some of those are competitively bid contracts dependent on the project, but you know, approximately 200 of those are, are what we call dock crews. They come in every day and, and they do the work just like uh, an Eversource lineman does. And, and for storm preparation, we have contracts with, with many different groups, you know, across, across the country. You know, when we have a big event like this, we're bringing 
you know, I think in this event, it was 12 different states. So um, as part of our emergency preparedness is, you know, securing relationships and contracts with uh, with outside resources. And it's just not line work, is it's for food, lodging, wired down guards, the whole gamut. So, you know, we recognize, you know, when you have, a, have an event like ECES, you, you're never going to have enough people on property. You know, that, that just isn't financially responsible. It's just not realistic. So we we have contracts and relationships um, all in place. And that's, again, why we can ramp up so quickly when the need arises. The, uh, the regional operations centers that uh, exist around the state, uh, you had linemen, um, uh, linemen based in, in my part of the state, which is the 20th district, which goes from Old Saybrook all the way up to uh, New London and um, towns above. Um, you had a lineman stationed in New London and Mystic. Uh, I believe there were 18 to 20 uh, in each facility, and that um, has been whittled down by less than half uh, over the years. And you've gone to a, um, a response specialist program uh, that's throughout. I think uh, uh, Mr. Judge mentioned that uh, earlier in his presentation. Um, is that done based on an operational efficiency to increase uh, profits or how has that uh, affected a response? Because my understanding is that the response has suffered as a result of that. Uh, no, I, I mean, you know, I, I would, I would definitely, you know, disagree with that. As Mr. Judge uh, indicated earlier, our reliability uh, since 2011 has improved remarkably, both uh, keeping the lights on, which is our number one priority, but also restoring when they go out. Um, at the time of the merger, we created the, um, you know, shortly after the response uh, organization, the RSO. And what the RSO is, is fully trained, uh, top rated line workers. Uh, we have approximately 120 of those, those, those individuals. They work 24-7. So what that means is when there's an outage, um, we have uh, rated people who are able to respond immediately and do the full scope of the line worker's job. These uh, line workers, and it, and it works extremely well for us, and I, I can't say enough for those of those people. They can either work by themselves or we even have agreements with, with this group that they can come together with one people or two people uh, to form a bigger group. Uh, they do all all scopes of the job, and that was done mainly to improve customer service. Prior to that, we had a, a, a smaller number of people who would go to the outage, size it up, and then we would have to call in a crew um, and hope someone was available. They would go to the service center, drive to the job location, and do their jobs. But after I was that all that also caused those that crew to be home for rest. They worked all night, so now they need to rest. So they weren't here the next day to do the very important work that we need them to do. So the RSO group improves restoration. Um, it um, improves our efficiency because now we actually have more hands available during the day because fewer and fewer people are home for rest. Um, and again, we have... Um, a large contingent of crews, um, contractors, native contractors from Connecticut, live in Connecticut, work in Connecticut, and they also help us. But then in the case of storm response, I just wanted to touch on the, the service center building. So we have a model when we, when we have a large event, we like to break down the company, our electric system into the smallest pieces possible. So, we break down to what we call a, a storm EOC that handles a, a region of, of, of our service territory. And then within that structure, we have groups that we call restoration management teams. And that would be a dispatcher, someone who operates the electric system, a crew supervisor, someone who's knowledgeable about crew size and um, you know how many crews I need to do a particular job. And then there's a person who keeps our outage management system up to date. And they may only have one town or two towns. And then beyond that, and we use this during this big event, 
we go to what we call local control. So we'll take a, uh, a group of trained individuals um, and we'll put them in a substation. So, you know, t uh, towns have, you know, could have several substations, but we give responsibility for the res restoration of that substation and the feeders that come out of that substation to an even smaller group. And what that does is allows us to bring in 2,500 crews, but use them very efficiently in order to get priorities done in restoration. And, and it's kind of interesting because in many cases, service centers where crews work out of every day, during a storm, they may be vacant because crews are dispersed and the management of the crews is dispersed. As I was showing Senator Needleman the other day, we have trailers with all of our tools, outage management, radios, all of the tools we need to, to manage the restoration. And we can uh, hook those up to the back of a pickup and put them every, anywhere we want. So the whole philosophy of restoration for us is break it down into the smallest component so people are managing a very uh, tight, SWAT-like type uh, of, of group of individuals. And, um, and then we also, We've also made changes like instead of giving crews um, five or 10 jobs and say, hey, go do all this work and get back to us at the end of the day. And then we find at the end of the day, they only did five. We give one job per crew. So we know what the crew is working on. I'm able to, in my calls, talk to my people about how many crews are on the system. What are they working on? What's the ETR? And we can be very efficient in terms of how we run crews. So, so those are just some of the things that we do. Senator, could I add on for just a minute? Is that possible? Sure. Th thank you. You know, the, the, the perception issue that Senator Needleman talked about is very real. I wish customers felt better about the, 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 the service that we provide. And also this perception that we're, we're driven only by shareholders. Um, what I would tell you is that there's no more difficult place to, to run a utility, no more rigor mm -hmm. anywhere that I'm aware of, than in Connecticut with Pura. You know, our rates are based upon um, an allowed return on equity that we can earn up to nine and a quarter percent. That is the lowest uh, of the three states that we serve. In fact, if you went nationally and looked at 100 rate proceedings, it's in the bottom quartile, I'm sure. So we're not making a lot of money in Connecticut Light and Power. In fact, last year we didn't make the 9.25, we made 8.7%, and we made less than 9% the year before that. If we were motivated only by efficiencies to drive earnings, we'd get those numbers up to the nine and a quarter. We haven't done that. We're motivated by, by being productive and reducing our costs for our customers in the long term. We know we're high priced and we're trying to do our best to manage both the, the expectations of the customer and the cost that they're paying. Well, and I think anybody in business is, is wants to do that. My, my natural question after that was, if you're making a, a billion or two a billion or two billion dollars in profit, is it uh, necessary to ask for a rate increase based on that, whether it's eight point seven percent or nine uh, in a quarter? Ask for a rate increase right now? Are you saying? Or any time when you're showing those kinds of profits and the yeah, we, is doing yeah. very well, is that is that the time to ask for uh, rate increases, or um, does it seem a bit? We're, 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 man, we're, we're mandated by law in the state to have a rate review every four years. So we're, we're actually, I think the third, we're in the third year of, uh, of that review right now. And we're under earning based upon the allowed hour week. And we'll have to see what happens uh, next year. So we'll talk about that, um, you know, in a minute, but the, um, the, the contractors that you spoke about, the resource, uh, specialists that you spoke about and the linemen that are on the job, uh, are those all paid out of ratepayer funds or does the state contribute dollars uh, for different pockets of those? Those are paid for by the company and, and uh, to the extent that we have a, a rate proceeding, it would be the cost it would be the cost structure that would present to the regulator for, for developing the rates. So those are all within within ratepayer dollars um, for the energy that you sell. That funds the operation. There are no uh, state dollars or anything that offsets any contractors or resource specialists, response specialists, or any of that. 
I'm not aware of any state subsidies. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, communication failures uh, that uh, happened back in the days of the hurricane and in 2017 uh, were promised to be fixed uh, with regard to uh, a new computer system. Uh, I think you may have touched on that briefly in your in your uh, earlier remarks, but what happened to that uh, communication system and, and what are we doing uh, in terms of uh, what is the plan now, uh, you know, the Monday morning quarterback review to try to get that fixed? If I may, let me talk a little bit about what happened in 2017, something I testified to the same committee about, and then uh, what happened this time. They were two very different events. In 2017, we had an issue with how the system was processing. It would, uh, every time a customer had a request, the system was going all the way through the customer's entire record history, and it was causing a slowdown on the system. We actually had points at which the system was completely hard shut down. I equate that experience to being like if you had to go into your closet to get, get a belt, that every time you went in to get your belt, you actually touched everything in your closet. That's what the computer system was doing. We fixed that. That issue has not occurred again. What occurred in this time was the sheer volume. So we sized and test our system to the most concurrent inbound volume that we had ever seen. And that largest concurrent was in Superstorm Sandy. We sized our system and performance tested it against that inbound volume times 20%, and it was still not sufficient for the inbound volume. And as we look at it today, we are adjusting the system so that they can handle a much larger volume. Clearly that benchmark is higher. And what I think is happening is that we've opened new communication channels. So since since the, the certainly Superstorm Sandy, but even since 2017, we've opened up the mobile app. We now have two-way text. I have customers on two-way text who may text us 10, 20, 30 times in a day to check their outage status um, because they, they're anxious and obviously would like information. And so that puts pressure on the systems and we have uh, more channels open. So we are uh, in the process now uh, of adjusting our systems to now support what we now know is a new peak of 1.1 million incoming concurrent uh, requests, which is what we saw in this storm. And so given the fact that Laura's coming in with, it hit landfall with twice the wind capacity that uh, this last tropical storm had, would, would, be, would that communication plus 20% be adequate or are you ramping up for a larger storm? And I'll stop there for the moment. Well, I think that's a good question. I'm working with our IT team now to, uh, and our partners, such as AT&T to help us on the telephony to increase the capability so that we can handle a larger incoming call volume uh, and a larger inbound volume. It's not just phone calls coming in. It's also the, uh, the requests coming in via Eversource.com or via the mobile app. So we're in the process of evaluating that today and we'll be looking at what those systems we've already made changes to accommodate more volume. But to your point, uh, if it were greater than 1.1 1 .1 plus 20%, um, what, what should we set it at? We will be evaluating those uh, options, obviously uh, looking at the cost and uh, of implementing because, and the probability of it happening. So it is, uh, we'll be looking at all of that to make the best decision to ensure that we can be there for customers. Thank you uh, for that answer. And the reason I ask is that most of the communities uh, around the state are tied in with Everbridge, the 911 system that allows them communication to their to their uh, residents in their towns. And one of the towns in my, uh, my district does a very good job uh, when power is out using that system to coordinate and communicate uh, with um, with the people that are impacted by the power outage. Uh, has there been any talk about uh, partnering with the municipalities and uh, getting information with regard to whatever your communication is and then uh, asking them for feedback with regard to the 9-11 Everbridge uh, as a way to expedite and 
and speed up uh, the response time for communicating to people? Senator Formica, I think that is an excellent suggestion. We have been working with the municipalities, and actually I had the pleasure of working with Senator Needleman in supporting uh, the uh, reporting of two one of fire and police calls, and we implemented a portal in Connecticut just in November, which uh, has been very popular, allowed a more efficient operation for reporting those fire and police calls. But obviously, we also handle those via phone. But your conversation is suggesting that perhaps an, another way of communicating to customers, leveraging the town's nine one one, I think is something to certainly explore. We know that our customers want to get information from us, but they also look to their local leaders. And so we are we are very interested in identifying ways that we can equip our local leaders, which we do through community liaisons, to be prepared to respond to customers. Uh, but I think we can, I think what you're suggesting is a very good idea. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think it might, um, judging from my review of how that EOC worked in this town, it seemed to be, uh, it seemed to do uh, very well. Um, in terms of um, equipment, uh, do you do you repair uh, all of the, the your own equipment? For example, if transformers go out, do you have a, uh, or if trucks go down, do you have your own uh, repair and replacement, or do you just buy new uh, when when these things happen? Because I'm sure many of these transformers, for example, would be damaged uh, but repairable. Um, is, is the process to go buy all new or do you have uh, in-house folks that repair those things? So, so for things like vehicles and equipment, those types of things, we, we do some repairs uh, internal um, and um, if they get substantial, um, we, would, we would go to an external garage, those types of things. But, you know, during a storm, um, you know, during our storm prep, we have mobile garage teams that go out and and uh, if a vehicle has a problem, they'll go out and and uh, try to remedy remedy the, the problem so we don't lose the the vehicle. You know, things like transformers. Um, you know, you know, if a transformer gets damaged during the storm, really depending on what happens to it. You know, it's really not cost effective for us to. Um, to fix it, you know, you're dealing with dielectric fluid and electrical testing and those types of things. So, um, you know, most transformers that sustain any type of significant damage would get retired and replaced. Yeah, I, I would expect that. I have a similar program in my business. I measure repair cost versus life of product and then when to determine. Um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just... used to do that, but we found that it's it, it's just cost prohibitive. Yeah. yeah. Um, your 10 year capital plan. Um, what how, what does that entail in terms of uh, uh, how much money you put aside for for that capital plan and uh, modernization? We know battery backup is coming. Uh, microgrids may be an opportunity to offset some of these delay in power. Uh, restorations if they were put somewhere um what what is that capital plan and does it include any of those things moving forward in the next i don't know if you do a one year five year ten year plan twenty year plan you must have something we we do um short and long-term planning you know one year operating plan but but uh, we have a five year capital plan as well um, I don't have the numbers readily available, but we spend about $500 million uh, a year on distribution uh, plants. Um, about a third of that is probably uh, resiliency related, but don't forget we also have a, a transmission a budget as well. And the transmission system, um, it served us very well. I went, and in this outage, one of the things that I did see was trees that fell on transmission lines. Um, what happened here is that the structures all stood up. Previous storms, we had actually transmission structures that fell down. So we were able to clear up the backbone. Craig's organization was able to clear up the backbone pretty quickly because the, the resiliency that we put into the transmission system paid off. So we dealt with that backbone early on, 25 uh, um, lines were out, and uh, obviously that lit up a bunch of uh, substations downstream. So. Uh, we spent, as I say, uh, probably um, a billion a year in transmission, and I don't know how much of that is in 
uh, in, in Connecticut, but certainly uh, 30, 40, 50 percent probably. What would be that as a percentage of sales, uh, your investment in capital infrastructure on a uh, on an annual basis? And, and if you can break it down within Connecticut or or over your service area. I'm sorry, what's the metric that you're looking for? I'm sorry. As, as a percentage of, of revenue, I say sales, because, but the percentage of revenue, how much of how much would be devoted to the capital plan? You said 500 million. I don't know what that is in relation to what you uh, what you gross. Um, gross revenues in Connecticut uh, electric have got to be about um, um, subject to check about two 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 billion dollars. So would 500 million be 25 percent? of that to would be that's, gone toward capital that's capital but th but don't forget o&m we have you know th 37 the li largest part of our workforce are in connecticut we have over 3700 employees who live and work in in connecticut so there's an operations and maintenance expense aspect of that we also have property taxes so, you know 60 no two-thirds of the towns in connecticut we're the largest taxpayer in the in the town we have uh, uh, income taxes as well. So there's a, a cross structure. It's not just depreciation on the plant. There's a lot of components to the to the income statement. No, I, and I understand that. I've, I've seen a few. Um, my, my question really, I'm trying to drill down to see how much of that is not a payroll or supplies or, uh, but what do you devote as a percentage on your, on your P&L statement or that goes to capital uh, infrastructure and your capital plan? Well, what I what I mentioned was about five hundred million dollars of cap spending every year, and, and to, subject to check, I think the revenue number is probably about two billion. Okay, so twenty five percent. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, you you may be aware that um, I was on um, kind of the opposite uh, side of our discussion that we had with the saving Millstone Station. Uh, and I worked very hard to uh, to save those 1,500 jobs and the $1.5 billion economic activity that it provides to the state, as well as the power that it provides each and every day. Um, I'm, I'm curious, in the beginning of this rate um, discussion, it, I think a, a, a comment came out of your organization that 90% of the rate cost was due to the, to the Dominion contract. And I think since then, uh, we've seen uh, that change a little bit, and based on your numbers today, you're talking about a four cents uh, seven, if I heard you right, uh, of of the potential rate increase. Um, I, you know, there's a there's a quote that was a negotiated power purchase agreement uh, based on the legislature's uh, ability for you to. Um, to negotiate the, for Millstone to sell its power in a different way. Um, am I correct in that? Say that again, I'm sorry. I, I broke up a little bit here. I apologize. So you need me to start over? <clears throat> no, I, I, I just the exact question. Just to, uh, The question that I'm, I'm asking about is um, Dominion's effect on the, the power purchase agreement, right? A negotiated agreement that you were at the table. That's correct. And we were when, when the legislation was was approved. Um, <clears throat> we were obligated to enter into the agreement. It was, it was approved by the regulator. I, I do want to sort of make let a clarifying. Let, let me just go. Just make a comment here, and that uh, you know, one of the comments that came out at the time from Deep, who's uh, responsibility was to participate in that power purchase agreement and oversee it was it says as a result of the final contracts negotiated by the EDCs and Dominion, Connecticut ratepayers will avoid costs of more than $2 billion over the 10 year contract term. This translates into a savings and a beneficial cost ratio. Uh, I'll just see if I can skip the contract negotiations were able to achieve these substantial ratepayer benefits while providing um, stability uh, to the supplier. Um, where would those $2 billion uh, in savings uh, be? I think you said that was a statement by, by Deep. I did, yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with that, but I, I did want to clarify the 90% is not inconsistent with what I said. 
because the 90% related to a certain aspect of the one, one component of the rate items that went into that seven cents. So that one component, the FMCC, the, the, uh, the impact of Dominion's millstone contract was 90% of that line item. And then overall, it ended up being about four cents of the seven cents. Was that uh, line item the federally mandated bypass Correct. charge? And yeah, correct. Were there other um, were there other um, other programs involved in that that had uh, some interest in uh, raising that rate? Uh, as I said, ninety percent of that rate change had to do with Dominion. The other the other components of it were relatively small, and I don't have them. This was a discussion that took place at, at Tura, as you know, last week in terms of the, the granularity of the rate. I don't have the, those details available here today. All right, if you could provide those details going forward, because I don't think uh, I, I've been able to find, I understand there are 23 other programs uh, in there that uh, that contributed to that, to that rate change. Uh, and I'm trying to understand what each of those represented. We'll certainly comply with that. All right. Um, the Eversource is, is uh, working with um, Orsted to develop a wind, offshore wind program. Mm -hmm. um, are you participating in the, in the uh, uh, renovation costs for uh, the pier in New London, the state pier? We are. Partnership is involved in that. And is that, that those dollars, are they part of your capital plan, that $500 million, or is that in which is recoverable by rates, or how is that recoverable? No, that's not recoverable in rates. That's in our uh, unregulated venture. And the goal is to make that facility the epicenter of offshore wind development and the community benefits. Uh, you can imagine uh, if that happens. I, I am an, uh, also a proponent of offshore wind as, uh, as an opportunity to offset uh, our dwindling generation uh, over the next uh, decade. So. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with that, but would, would you have to negotiate a power purchase agreement uh, for those megawatts that are uh, contributed or, or won by the partnership of Orsted Eversource? So would you be negotiating that power purchase agreement with yourself? The, um, the various uh, uh, states on the Northeast have an interest in, in, in uh, offshore wind development. And we've won some contracts in uh, Connecticut, we've won uh, contracts in Rhode Island, we've won contracts in, 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 in New York. And it comes down to a competitive bid and the winning bid, the, the bids are evaluated by the, by the regulator and the, the winning bid is then entered into as a contract. The terms are negotiated between a local EDC, the electric distribution company and the winning bidder. In that example, it would be the combination of Orsted and, and Eversource as the winning bidder. Okay, and so you you would be involved in negotiating the power that power purchase agreement with yourself and ever, with Orsted. Yep, and we and we have a code of conduct, and we have very discrete lines of responsibility and separation between the the, the groups that do that. And and the millstone. Um, <clears throat> The Millstone Power Purchase Agreement is around 4.9 cents. Um, 4.99. 4.99 cents. And <laughs> do you think that the wind, uh, offshore wind, is going to come in cheaper than that? <clears throat> I can't uh, venture a guess. The cost of wind has come down dramatically um, uh, over the years. We're benefited by the experience in Europe and El Asia and elsewhere. What was once cost prohibitive, uh, a cost like for Cape Wind was sort of the initial try here in the United States. Costs now are probably a third of, of, of the Cape Wind pricing, all less. The and what was Cape Wind? Cape Wind was over 20 cents, wasn't it? It was, it was. So, so a third of that would be seven or eight cents, which would be almost double what Dominion is, uh, the power purchase agreement. So Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not so sure it's an apples and apples comparison. Um, there's certainly uh, capacity benefits. I think we only have energy benefits associated with the, uh, the Dominion contract. But if, if, if you want to discuss in granularity more about this topic, I'd, I'd prefer to bring into one of the principals on our company that actually negotiated it, Jim Shukaro. I would just, you know, like in a general term for everybody to understand that the, the cost to keep our baseload supply open while we 
while we move to the next generation of energy generation and a bridge to either renewables or whatever else, because, you know, we can't really get more gas, uh, you know, because of the pipeline restrictions or having uh, transmission issues, getting hydro power from Quebec. Um, so what is there uh, other than that? And, and so I'm trying to understand that these $2 billion in, in savings as touted by uh, or, or cost avoidance as touted by DEEP when this PPA was signed, um, you know, is a benefit to the ratepayer. And um, the prices, I believe, are out for New York and Rhode Island. Uh, I'm not sure if the Vineyard Wind, I know that the contract came out the other day, but I don't know if I saw the price there. Do you know what those prices may be off the top of your head? Does anybody on your team know that answer? Not on the, uh, not on this proceeding. Not on the call. Okay. All right. I ask all those things because we're talking about uh, a number of things with you today. We're talking about operational efficiencies. We're talking about rate hike requests, and we're talking about management um, and deploying uh, field crews who did a remarkable job. I agree with you 100%. They did a remarkable job working uh, double shifts uh, in difficult conditions to try to get that through. So I'm, I'm extremely... I'm extremely, extremely proud and honored to have the employees that we did. They did an extraordinary job. Yeah. Um, so um, we're talking about management, um, which, by the way, I understood that management in your company used to be predicated on having so much experience on the ground uh, and that you've kind of gone away from that. Uh, it <clears throat> varies by function. If you're talking about operations, maybe, Craig, you could get a, a pine on on advancing yeah. in operations? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 certainly not the case with, you know, my team. Um, you know, I have 40 years of operations experience in the utility. Um, my incident commander here in Connecticut, Mike Hayhurst, has, you know, that much or more. Um, came up through the ranks, ran control centers. Um, our operations section chief in Connecticut, uh, same thing, very, uh, you know, uh, grounded on all aspects of the business, um, well, hundred percent operations background. Um, you know, we, my team, uh, knows operations backwards and forwards. Okay. That's great. I just want to make sure that that was out on the record as well. Um, uh, and then my, my final question has to do with the energy efficiency uh, program that you uh, you oversee or try to promote energy efficiency, yet the transmission costs and the rates uh, seem to go up when people uh, when people uh, are efficient with their energy use. Can you touch on that, and then I will I will back off and thank you very much. To my I'm uh, very pleased to talk about energy efficiency, and as Mr. Judge noted, we. Do take great pride. I have an amazing team that really uh, works to deliver energy efficiency services to our customers. And uh, sometimes I get the question, you know, with all you've done, is there more to do? There is so much more to do. A big piece starts with the building envelope, with our home envelope, ensuring that our customers are investing in, in insulation. And I'm very pleased that with the advent of COVID, we have enhanced the incentives associated with that so that for most customers for this for a typical home uh, customers who can uh, engage in our home energy services and put in insulation it uh, typically will be no cost to them that's really the biggest piece because at the yes there's a lot of appliances and end load uses in a home but a big driver in what we have seen this summer uh, with the increases in usage 26 percent from uh, june as compared to may a uh, 35% increase in July is largely due to the cooling degree days and needing to cool our homes. And so we're using uh, more air conditioning because of the, of the heat. So we also have uh, incentives to encourage investing in high efficiency appliances, but that investment in a high efficiency air conditioner goes a lot further when I'm combining it with a well insulated home. So uh, what we are focused on doing is, is continuing to 
get our message out to customers of options they have to help them manage their usage. Uh, and energy efficiency uh, continues to be one of the best things customers can do to help reduce their overall usage. I understand, but the, the cost of, the, did it drive the transmission rates up? Isn't that what I read, that that's what, uh, that the transmission rates went up as a result of lower use? Oh, in regards to overall lower usage, I would need to um, potentially ask Jim Shukro to talk about that entire impact on the transmission system and the lower usage that we saw across the region, largely due to a reduction in uh, CNI load associated with COVID. But I would uh, turn that over to Jim Shukro to talk about how that aspect of those uh, that particular element of the rate it works. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, sir. I can. I don't okay, very, very good. Just wanted to confirm, um, Senator. The, uh, you're referring to what's known as the transmission adjustment clause. That was part of the changes that occurred uh, for the July 1 um, increase. That was really one of the drivers of that was associated with what they call the peak usage, the coincident peak, and how those costs are spread throughout New England as a function of the uh, basically the 12 month coincident peak. It's very technical, it's, it's formulaic, but it was really a peak driver during calendar year 2019. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. I've, I've gone a little longer than I'd anticipated. I wanna thank the chairman for his latitude and thank you all for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Formica. So we have now